Good morning, everyone. Let's plug this in. Uh, so I, I, I noticed a really interesting thing. So I was here yesterday as well, and uh, that these two rooms, so next door is all the cool and shiny toys, uh, and this room is all the people who are getting into the mucky, dirty stuff, trying to make it work. Um, so I'm a bit disappointed there aren't, there aren't actually more people in this room. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, Andy Armo, and unfortunately I'm going to slightly repeat some of what Paul and Charlotte have said. Um, so a little bit about Andy Armo. Andy Armo uses 3D scanning and 3D printing to make orthotics for children with disabilities, things like back braces and wrist splints and stuff like that. Um, and that's cool, but actually, do you know what? It's just not really important. Um, the technology is not important. This is probably the least technical talk you're going to hear. I actually don't care about the technology per se. What I'm interested in is what, in my brain and other people's brains, it may, starts to make what's possible. So before I tell you more about what we've done, I'm going to tell you about why we started. It started because of my son, Diamo, um, born 2003, severely disabled. The biggest challenge were his orthotics. Without his back brace, he couldn't breathe properly. He couldn't eat. We couldn't leave the house. And it could take up to six months for that to come back. This is how you make them at the moment. You get pinned down and wrapped in plaster. It's a horrific process. It's inaccurate, very slow. It's also um, causing all sorts of distress for children who, who can't communicate. And then it gets sent away for handmade production. And as I say, it can take up to six months to come back. We started to look at why is, why is, this, why is this whole service so crappy? Um, we thought it was just us. And we started to, to kind of do the research and look at it globally. And we've realized actually there's two huge problems. There's a demand capacity gap. So just an example, in the UK, 2.1 million people go through the orthotic service per year. There's only 250 orthotists left to serve those 2.1 million. Do the maths. Big number. Um, that problem is extrapolated across the entire world. And that doesn't even take into account about three quarters of the world does, doesn't even have that service, but does have that medical problem. And there's an evidence gap. We actually don't know what works. Um, one of the scary things about getting involved in the medical field um, is you start, to, you start to find out how much we don't know or how much we, 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 we kind of think we know something works, but we don't necessarily know how. So that kind of led us to a big mission, which was how do you get a medically effective orthosis to everyone globally within one week of their need? Now, that's a pretty big mission in itself, and then you multiply it up to 100 million people. The plan is we are building a company to serve 100 million people per year. That number is growing by 6% annual compound growth. So, and, and actually that number is probably a, a big un underestimation. Now, additive manufacturing and 3D scanning, all these technologies have a huge role to, to play in fixing this problem. But, yes, that's a Victorian factory. Um, now, what a lot of people don't, don't necessarily realize is our entire world's work, the, everything we still think about is actually based 100 to 200 years ago. We still think like the industrial age. All of our hierarchies, the way we pay for things, the way we do things, the only thing that's really changed has, is the supply chain. So, and that covers from health to manufacturing. Um, so we become really efficient at delivering the wrong thing. Um, yes, uh, my, my biggest bugbear is, is Yoda heads um, uh, on 3D printers. We're not going to talk too much about that. But, um, you know, I, I think there is something we, got, we had to learn from people like the food industry. Everyone talks about carbon and air miles. It's all bull, all right? It's actually less carbon to grow something in Kenya and fly it over when you actually look at that entire carbon footprint. And we have to think about some of these things around 3D printing. There are some things that are absolutely suitable for 3D printing and some things that aren't. That will change... But let's not pretend it's good at what it's not good at yet. Um, and I, I, I say, uh, right now, too much of the conversation, beyond perhaps the people in this room, it, it's the around 3D printing, is symptomatic of our consumer culture. And that's really not going to change the way we do, we do things. So we started to build this company and uh, we got beaten up by investors a lot. Um, and so we had to go this really annoying Silicon Valley term, full stack. Um, or I prefer it's been called obsessed with everything. Um, we realized that you can't just be about technology. You can't just be about service. You had to understand everything. And if you, if you weren't, you couldn't actually solve big global problems. So we've got expertise in our teams from fashion, 
Um, we have uh, the person who's in charge of the Nike Football World Cup boots, right through to physicists and, of course, clinicians in between. Um, and again, none of that matters. <laughs> and I keep the, the word empathy has become a kind of core ethos of our company. Um, if you don't design these things with families from the beginning, and I'm talking about the service, the software, the products, absolutely everything, you're going to build the wrong thing, right? You, you're going to build something that will win a couple of shiny awards, but will fail in a couple of years. So we had to ensure, and this is the other, the reason we use families and not patients, it's the family that's affected, right? It's not the patient. Patient gets, has stuff done to them. Everyone is impacted by healthcare, and yet our entire healthcare system does stuff to people. So we realized that really what we had to start doing was had to completely design a new clinical service. So this clinical service we're building around orthotics doesn't actually exist right now. We don't need a factory. We had to go straight to mobile, straight to cloud. Now that's painful within healthcare, especially around privacy data, and et cetera. But you can't solve healthcare problems at scale unless you go straight to that point. So an, an example of how that changes when you start putting all these things, um, for those who've seen uh, a build model, what you're actually seeing there is a back brace and what's called an ankle foot orthotic. Now, currently, you can only hand make one of these things at a time. I can make six things at the same time at the cost of one thing. Now, the cost differential when we start doing that sort of stuff, and we were talking about the dark ages of 3D printing. We are in the dark ages. We're only going to get more and more efficient. To give you an idea, the first back brace we cost, uh, cost 800 pounds. Uh, four iterations later, we had it down to 280. Four iterations in less than a year. And that means we're able to do this. So we, these are real things being put on real people right now. Um, and what we've been able to, to, to show, we've gone from six months to a week, and we technically know we can get that down to 48 hours. So when we start talking about delivering that type of... Uh, and that, that's a cost, huge cost saving across healthcare. Now, all of that's really great, and there's plenty of money. What there isn't is a lot of imagination of how the hell you use that money to solve the problem and build a service that actually makes an impact. This is by far the biggest problem I have. Um, and it's actually a problem for, for Europe in general. Europe is very risk-averse, uh, whilst the US isn't. But US investors really don't care about anything that isn't in the US because, you know, the US is the center of the world, uh, especially in a VCI. Problems. We've talked about material science. Um, this is my biggest problem. Materials are getting there. They're not quite there. Um, for, for anyone who's uh, uh, kind of interested in that area, we use something called Nylon 12, which has been FDA approved. Nylon 11 is coming out at the moment. Um, there's a long, long way to go before kind of materials catch, catch up to what we can design. Um, the next problem especially in medical, is traceability and quality. We're really good at this with manuf uh, mass manufacture. We're not very good at this with 3D printing. And that makes material science really h even harder because why haven't we start using recyclable materials? Where does that plastic come from? What's the mix? There are all these sorts of things. What happens to the plastic in a high humidity environment? Well, it breaks down faster. Well, how do you design that in? It's all these sorts of questions we have to think about. So I can create the perfect design, but what happens to the printer at the other end? Now, at the moment, what happens, we just throw 3D printers into an industrial age process and expect everything to be cheaper, which is kind of what happens right now. Um, what we're doing is, the, and the, we have to do radical redesign. That is invisible to the user. Now, the people in that room, uh, in the Googles and the Facebooks and the et cetera, have done that really well. They've hidden these things into these wonderful black boxes. But in these mucky service design worlds of healthcare, uh, the last mile drone, you know, that's where these problems really start, start to occur. Um, and we, we need to get to this point of that, that, you know, how did I ever live without Google moment within 3D printing, within healthcare and these other areas. So we need to kind of get to what, you know, what's Web 3.0 and beyond now and bring that to the material world. So some very quick examples of that. Um, in, in Toyota, and uh, the, the automotive industry is not having a great time at the moment, but actually Toyota's became too efficient. The robots, robots don't think, they don't understand how to, they're really great at cutting current costs, and what Toyota had to bring back is what they called the gods. The gods were the people who used to hand beat everything, and they had to bring them all back because they couldn't become any more efficient, and they had to bring back a human brain 
to go, right, we actually need to rethink how we do these things. So Toyota, Toyota brought back all these gods kind of out of retirement because they realized the next stage of efficiency had to be human. So that, that kind of compartmentalized knowledge, um, it misses the bigger picture. Uh, we've talked about 3D hubs. That's a world picture. We won't, Charlotte's covered that way better than I, than I could. Um, you know, I think what's really interesting is what happens when all those things, and of which, whilst there's a lot, there's going to be a lot more, what happens when they're actually being utilized 24-7? Um, so an example of that full stack uh, that I really admire, Tesla, he said, you know what, screw the oil companies, I'm going to build my own electric charging network. That's 2014, and by the end of 2015, it's almost going to increase by 50%, and the same picture in Europe. Now, he's got the money to do so, but I think the real radical change is only going to happen with people like him who have the cash uh, to, to do so. So finally, um, I think the whole point of talks uh, that I do and, and days like this is it's about the imagination, right? So you can't build what you can't imagine. Um, and and I, I would encourage you, know, you to go do more of these things and imagine more so you can go and build more and more interesting things. But fundamentally, everything I've said, and this is the most important thing, and it's the thing that is missed over and over and over again, empathy. Empathy is the thing that creates radical disruption. I don't care about iterative disruption or iterative improvement. Who cares? We're at the margins of that. We, it's about radical disruption now. That's how we have to solve these global problems now. Thank you. <laughs>